In this module, we will examine uniform circular motion and acceleration along a curved path. Consider motion with a constant instantaneous speed on a circular path. Even though the speed is constant, the direction of the velocity changes as we move around a circle. The red arrow denotes a velocity vector tangent to the circular path. Notice that as we move around the circle, the direction of the velocity vector changes. And because the velocity vector changes with time, there is an acceleration, even though the speed is constant. If there were any acceleration in the direction of the velocity, the speed would change. We know this from considering uh, motion under a constant acceleration in one dimension. If there is an acceleration in the direction of the velocity in this one dimension, then the velocity would change with time. Since the velocity has a constant magnitude, there is no acceleration in the direction of the velocity. So the acceleration must be perpendicular to the velocity vector always. And we see that as the velocity vector goes around the path, the acceleration vector always points towards the center of the circular path. Why towards the center instead of towards uh, instead of directly away from the center? Well, if you look at the motion of the velocity vector, it's fairly easy to see if you let a small amount of time change that the acceleration vector must be pointing inward towards the center of the circular path. This kind of acceleration is called centripetal acceleration and is usually denoted with uh, a vector a sub c or as a vector a sub r for radial acceleration. Please don't confuse this with something called centrifugal acceleration. This is an acceleration that is experienced by an object when the acceleration is measured in an accelerating frame. It's something that we may consider in a future module. The magnitude of the centripetal acceleration can only depend on the radius of the path and the speed of the object v. Let's use dimensional analysis to try and determine what the equation for the centripetal acceleration must be. We know that the centripetal acceleration will be proportional to the radius r to some power, let's call it m, times the speed of the object v to some other power, call it n. Now, we know that acceleration has units of length per time squared, and that this is going to be equal to length to the m times the units of velocity, which are length to the n over time to the n. So we see by equating powers of the same object on the left and the right hand side of the equation, uh, we see that for length, which has is to the first power on the left hand side, must be equal to m plus n because l is to the power of n plus n and time which is to the power minus 2 on the left hand side must be equal to minus n we immediately see that n is equal to 2 m is equal to minus 1 and that our centripetal acceleration must be therefore proportional to the speed squared divided by the radius now we say it's proportional to this because there may be some numerical constant in here and, and dimensional analysis is not going to allow us to determine what this numerical constant is. Before we figure out what that is, let's look at a couple of other useful quantities. The time it takes to complete one circuit of the circular path is called the period T. Now, since the circumference of a circular path is 2 pi times the radius, the constant speed of motion must be 2 pi times the radius, the distance traveled, divided by the time, which is the period, so 2 pi r over t. Now, a very useful quantity associated with any kind of periodic motion, in this case circular motion, is the angular velocity. It's defined as 2 pi divided by the period, and in this case, this is equal to v over r. Omega has units of radians per second. It measures rates at which angular distance around the circle is traversed. Remember that there are 2 pi radians in 360 degrees. So it turns out that we can express the position vector of an object moving at constant speed v around the circle, radius r, in the following way. 
r, the position vector as a function of time, is going to be equal to minus r cosine omega t in the i hat direction, plus r sine omega t times the j hat direction. Now this is one possible description of the position vector as a function of time. To see that this is actually correct, let's look at a few specific examples. Consider at t equals zero what we have. At t equals zero, uh, well, cosine of zero is one, sine of zero is zero, so our position vector is going to be equal to minus r i hat, and it points towards the left, towards the left edge of our circular path. This is where our particle starts its motion at t equals zero. Now let's move one eighth of the of the way around the circular path, one eighth of the period. So if we let little t be the period over eight, then omega times t is going to be pi over four. So if we now evaluate the cosine and the sine with their argument being pi over four, we find that the position vector is minus r over root two i hat plus r over root two j hat. And its position is illustrated by the black arrow in the figure. If we go towards a quarter of the total period, t equals capital T over four, then the argument to the trigonometric functions is going to be pi over two. And we see that the position vector is going to be r j hat pointing straight up. So the particle is moved from the left most edge of the circular path all the way in a clockwise direction towards the top of the circular path. And if we go yet another eighth of a period around the, circuit, uh, the path, we see that the argument of the trigonometric function is now three pi over four. We can evaluate this. We find the position vector is r over root two i hat plus r over root two j hat. And it's just continued in its clockwise motion around the path. Now, let's consider the velocity, which is just the time derivative of the position vector. Well, we can easily take time derivatives of cosine and sine of omega t. We're just going to bring out a factor of omega. And for cosine, we're going to get minus omega sine omega t. And for the derivative of the sine, we're going to get omega cosine omega t. And if we recall that omega is v over r, we find that the velocity is going to be given by the speed v times sine omega t i hat plus v cosine omega t j hat. And let's consider a few of uh, the example times in here. So at t equals zero, sine of zero is zero, cosine of zero is one. So we see that the velocity is v pointed directly up. And so on as we start to move around the circle at uh, the top of the path when t is uh, one quarter of the period, then omega t is pi over two. Then we see that the velocity is pointing directly to the right and so on. If we consider the magnitude of the velocity, we can get this by taking the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. We see that the v squared factors out and taking the square root, we just get a factor of v and inside the radical, we have sine squared omega t plus cosine uh, squared omega t and that's just one. So we see that the magnitude of the velocity is a constant v. And of course, we're looking at uniform circular motion, motion with a constant speed around our circular path. The velocity is changing because the direction is changing, but the speed remains constant. We can now examine the acceleration by taking the time derivative of the velocity. Again, eliminating omega in terms of v over r, our result is that we have v squared over r times cosine omega t i hat minus v squared over r sine omega t j hat. And if we look at t equals zero, what we see is the acceleration is v squared over r in the i hat direction, pointing radially inward towards the center of the circular path. And if we consider motion at later times, the acceleration, for instance, when we are one quarter of the way around the path, that is when omega t is pi over two, is going to be minus v squared over r j hat. Again, pointing radial inward. This time, it's the down uh, direction. 
Similarly, we can look at the magnitude of the acceleration. Uh, this again will be given by the square root of the sum of the squares of the components of the acceleration. And we see that this turns out to be v squared over r. So we see that the result from our dimensional analysis that the magnitude of the acceleration should be proportional to v squared over r is actually equal to v squared over r. The proportionality constant is just 1. Now, if we want to, we could write the acceleration in vector form as minus v squared over r squared times the radial position vector or as minus omega squared times the radial position vector, the minus sign just making it so that the acceleration points radially inward. Now, in summary, we see that for motion with a constant speed v on a circular path of radius r, the centripetal acceleration points in the inward radial direction and has magnitude v squared over r. An object moving in uniform circular motion also has an angular frequency omega given by omega equal to v over r, which is equal to 2 pi over the period t. Now, uniform circular motion is a special case that is easy to work with. But what if we have circular motion, but the speed is no longer constant? Well, in this case, as the speed, for example, increases, we see that the centripetal acceleration is going to increase with time. But there will still be a centripetal acceleration and it will be given instantaneously by the instantaneous speed squared over the radius. It's just that as time progresses, because the speed is also changing, the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration will change. But in order for the speed to be changing, the tangential speed to be changing, there must be an acceleration in the direction of the velocity. This is what we would call a tangential acceleration. And therefore, the velocity, or excuse me, the acceleration vector is not going to be radially inward. It's going to be displaced in the direction of the tangential acceleration. So the total acceleration is just going to be the vector sum of the centripetal acceleration and the tangential acceleration. Even more generally, we can have a curved path that is not circular. When a path is not circular, there is still a uniquely defined notion of a radius of curvature at each point along the path. This is something that can be determined geometrically, but we won't go into the details here. But at any given point along the path, we can determine the radius of curvature. And at that particular point in the path, knowing the radius of curvature and the instantaneous speed, we can calculate the centripetal acceleration along any curved path and it will be always pointing in the direction towards the inward part of the curve and have uh, and be perpendicular to the instantaneous velocity, there will still be a tangential acceleration, and it will still be given by the rate of change of the speed with respect to time.